I teach at University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw, Poland. I am very much involved in teacher training, language teacher training and uh, training teachers uh, for, uh, of languages for specific purposes. And uh, most probably my contribution today will be in this area, namely uh, reflecting on what particular solutions, what particular processes in terms of corpora use uh, we employed with teachers and how they actually uh, proved, uh, what they actually proved to be. Thank you. I should also say that uh, you are the editor of the electronic online journal Teaching English with Technology, so he knows what he is speaking about. <laughs> Our second thank, guest, thank you very much. Uh, yes. I'd like to present to you Alejandro Curado Fuentes uh, from the uh, University of Extremadura. Alejandro, could you speak a bit about yourself? I know you've got lots of experience in teaching uh, different ESP courses. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, my first uh, experience uh, in a conference uh, using video, so I hope I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay so far. Um, so yes, um, as uh, you have said, I've taught uh, ESP for several years at University of Extremadura in Spain the town of Cáceres, and uh, my students have ranged from uh, computer science to uh, philosophy and humanities students. Uh, currently, I'm teaching English for uh, business at uh, the Faculty of Business and Tourism, and also at the Faculty of, of Humanities, I'm teaching at the Master of uh, Research for um, different uh, degrees in humanities. Uh, including uh, teachers, uh, uh, pre-service teachers. So I've moved a little bit from ESP to, to pre-service uh, teaching training, and, uh, but I, I'm still using DDL techniques and things like that, so we can talk about that later. Um, but I, I'm going to focus on the ESP uh, part, of course, as, uh, as the, the theme of the, the roundtable uh, says. So thank you, thank you for... for for being here and uh, for your interest in, in this topic. Okay, so uh, uh, if you allow me, I'll tell you a bit about the, our er area of interest, why we are interested in this. Um, at some time, we English teachers decided we should not only um, put into electronic form the materials we have, but we also were worried about whether these materials fit the real needs of our students. I mean, whether they match the, what, the, uh, um, what other social ag agents uh, consider should be taught to our students. We include here both um, graduates of our faculty and uh, teachers of other subjects, uh, of other subjects. Uh, so what we did was to first um, to collect our own dossiers. We've only selected those that could be used now by our students. And then we asked other um, teachers of the, the two degrees to provide their materials in English they're using in their subjects. So, and now we are having uh, Yaroslav with us. Okay, I'm going. Uh, Yaroslav, will you just start speaking and I will show your presentation? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ina. I'm very happy that I can uh, speak to, uh, to, uh, to all of you. And uh, I would like to share a couple of ideas on uh, ad hoc corpora, or as we tend to call them, corpora. I'll explain in a while why uh, we tend to use this term. Uh, in the teacher training context and uh, specifically the e-learning materials development for languages for specific purposes, which is something that I'm uh, dealing with right now, uh, will be the major part of my talk. I will try to uh, show to you certain possible ideas for uh, tasks embedded in the Moodle e-learning platform, uh, which would make use of an ad hoc corpus uh, which would be created before. So uh, if we could move on, Ina. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, an introduction to what, uh, what a teacher made corpora are. Please note that we tend to use uh, the term teacher because uh, in our teacher training efforts, uh, we would very much like to uh, empower our teachers, to give them the tool uh, that would allow them to quickly uh, create uh, a certain body of, of texts that, that, that they could use for uh, teaching the particular discipline. Uh, in Poland it's very often the case that, uh, that language teachers get commissioned with uh, very uh, different disciplines um, pretty, at pretty short notice. Uh, they might not have uh, course books or they usually do not have course books for, for, for these disciplines. Uh, that's why uh, they need to uh, be taught how to cope on their own. So, uh, in other words, uh, we uh, see uh, a teacher-made corpus or an ad hoc corpus made by a teacher um, as a solution to this problem, that is, specialized materials that could be tailored to suit a given ESP class. Uh, on the one hand, if we think about native speaker text, but on the other hand, uh, compiling a learner corpus as a useful opportunity to diagnose learner lacks and perhaps think about the next step in, in ESP course design. So, in other words, if you think about that, I find this as quite a useful uh, distinction in ESP course design. Uh, are we going for native speaker texts or for uh, target domain texts that uh, could be the material for, uh, for reading text, for listening materials, uh, perhaps for grammar examples? Uh, or, on the other hand, uh, is it the case that at the end of the course, or perhaps in the middle of the course, we try to collect uh, a corpus based on our learner input uh, in this special, specialist domain? Uh, then this could be used uh, to diagnose learner legs, but perhaps also to, uh, to give us some kind of indication on uh, what to teach next year with, with a similar group. So I think that these two perspectives might be quite interesting to, uh, to uh, reconcile. Uh, let's go on, uh, please. Uh, very briefly, how we work with teachers. Uh, I, I do not go into details of DDL. I'm sure Alejandro will say much more about that. Uh, what we do with teachers is we want to equip teachers very quickly with pretty easy, uh, familiar procedures that uh, could allow them to create their own materials. So we teach them how to spot relevant sources, how to find such sources as newspaper sites, legislation databases, uh, discussion groups, perhaps equipment manuals or encyclopedia articles, how to retrieve these materials and how to uh, convert them to uh, the files that a particular corpus tools demands, be it PDF files or, or, or document files. Uh, obviously, spotting is not, uh, is not everything. Evaluating and selecting text is very important. So uh, those corpus compilers, those teachers need to be aware of the fact what particular, for instance, regional variety of English there they need to go for, what medium, uh, what genres what register, what text purpose, or source authority, right? So all of these uh, questions would need to be tackled, would need to be asked by a teacher, and would need to be answered uh, in the process. Uh, finally, on the technical context or immediate collocates. On the other hand, with learner texts, uh, common misuses, inappropriate uses, or certain typical problems with word order, uh, prepositions, uh, and others. Uh, let's move on, please. Uh, Ina asked the question uh, in her introduction, how shall we actually uh, use corpora um, in, uh, in the language classroom? Uh, this is what in the literature is called, for instance, the direct use of corpora, as opposed to the indirect use of corpora. Uh, the indirect use of corpora uh, involves uh, the use of data-driven uh, learning uh, materials in course books, in dictionaries, in language tests. Ob obviously, here in this seminar and in our research, we try to go for the direct one. That is, uh, teaching about corpora, teaching how to exploit corpora, and exploit corpora to teach. But if you think about this direct use of corpora, then uh, we need to make still one more distinction between the soft version and the hard version. 
the soft version and the hard version are different, are differentiated by who actually accesses uh, the corpus. Uh, Ina was talking ab about this as a major question. Um, in my uh, teacher training experiences, uh, it appears that uh, the, uh, the uh, hard version uh, uh, might not be that appropriate for learners uh, because it requires learners to have direct access to the corpus facilities. It requires learners to undergo training, uh, the training that the language teacher has to deliver, as uh, a language teacher who needs to be trained enough in order to train others. That's why uh, also because of lack of time that we have, uh, we try to go for the soft version, that is, the teacher has access to and the skills to use the corpus and the software. The teacher uh, extracts, evaluates and extracts relevant examples, uh, contexts, uh, paragraphs, uh, comparisons, whatever. And the teacher devises the tasks based on these, either for uh, the printout version or, as I, I will show uh, at the end of my talk, for the electronic format, where learners would work with these corpus-derived materials. So uh, this seems to be a safer option given a uh, limited time that we have for training and given still uh, limited skills that our, our teacher, teachers have. Uh, shall we move on? Uh, because obviously, uh, if we think about data-driven learning in the classroom, then authenticity and discovery approach that would build up learners' autonomy, uh, fuller linguistic context, uh, the context that a course book or a dictionary would never provide, uh, are all very important benefits. However, let's move on, please. Uh, if we think about the obstacles to concordance in use in the classroom, to this hard approach that I was talking about, uh, such problems as vast and confusing lexical information, rich but short and incomplete contexts, extracted decontextualized contexts, um, hard concordances as uh, pretty unfriendly tools, unfriendly uh, tools to be used by computer novices, um, and the fact that formulation of really productive queries uh, would need to demand also a certain amount of linguistic uh, expertise and linguistic knowledge. Uh, and all of these issues might not be tackled that uh, competently by the teacher as a facilitator, as a guide in the classroom. And then obviously uh, we tend to uh, we, we tend to take this step backwards. Perhaps in some other contexts, uh, the hard approach would be much more, um, much more uh, feasible. Let's move on. Alejandro is going to speak also on the soft uh, version and hard version. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good. He doesn't call it this way. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, just very, very quickly. Uh, we took into consideration two possible tools. Um, Ina is now most probably showing the text start screenshot, uh, which uh, proved Ina and the, co and, and the project team used in their investigation because it is much more powerful and it gives uh, much more versatile, much more comprehensive language information. However, it is also much less uh, friendly in terms of the interface, in terms of the navigation, so most probably for linguistic investigations, for more advanced uh, uses, uh, the latter one would be more appropriate, while the former one, uh, uh, text stat, would be, uh, would be just, uh, just enough to quickly train teachers in uh, those most basic uh, <coughs> concordancing procedures. Uh, all right, the final part of my talk, uh, let's move on, uh, uh, Ina, uh, would, con would concern how we could actually extract those corpus materials from the corpus and uh, design e-learning materials in a selected uh, virtual learning environment. Uh, we use Moodle in Poland, uh, Ina also used Moodle in, in Barcelona, um, and uh, if we think about Moodle as, as, as our learning environment, then of course uh, we have to first ask the question, uh, how do we actually imagine our learners to work with those uh, corpus-based uh, materials? Will it be the automatic 
quiz just like the CD-ROM that you buy and, and you, you do uh, on your own? Uh, or on the other hand, will it be uh, automatic calls but with uh, teacher presence as well? Or finally, will it be the case that uh, there will be some other learners who uh, you can actually work with, collaborate with? So in other words, the question of uh, the teacher and the question of learners, collaboration, will collaboration be actually the aspect of the course? If yes, will it be synchronous or asynchronous collaboration? These are all the questions that would have to be asked when uh, reflecting on uh, designing an e-learning course based on, on, on materials. Uh, if we think about Moodle activities, uh, then obviously the quiz is the, uh, the activity that would give greatest opportunities for, uh, for using corpus materials in activity design. Uh, we uh, experimented with such tasks as uh, different close-ended tasks, true-false, multiple-choice gap-fill matching, that were all based on selected corpus examples. Uh, corpus uh, examples that would be uh, extracted from the corpus by the designer. Uh, that would be uh, evaluated, irrelevant uh, concordances would be left out, and uh, only the ones that would be most prototypical and perhaps uh, easiest to understand in terms of language, uh, target language level of learners uh, would, be, uh, would be included in the activity. Uh, some other types of activities that you can see, uh, errors, sentences with errors to be corrected, where concordance input guides encourage students to make the comparison, um, gapped sentences from concordance output for multiple choice lexical close, uh, scrambled words or scrambled or jumbled syllables where again concordance output is gapped and uh, the words or, 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 or the phrases are to be reconstructed. Or finally, a uh, closed test, the classical closed test with the wider context for a selected concordance, the whole paragraph context, uh, for, uh, to reconstruct the deleted words. Uh, let's move on, please. Uh, some other activities that would demand the use of the, te uh, the, the presence of the teacher and the collaboration of, our, of other students uh, would uh, demand the use of a journal or a wiki. A journal that is a personal learning diary, a diary that is uh, visible by the very student who writes it and the teacher. Um, uh, could actually, it, it could actually be the case that the teacher provides corpus-based feedback on learners' errors for learners to self-correct, so in other words, the country. Uh, the final activity that, that was uh, quite interesting and quite useful was a glossary where uh, different students would add up to the glossary, uh, a collaborative glossary with corpus examples and explanations. So uh, that would be pretty much all from myself. Uh, I would like to conclude that, uh, just as I said, uh, what's most important in my, in my opinion is uh, not to um, stop while having the corpus and being ready with the corpus, uh, but rather what is important is how to make use of those, of those materials, how to make use of them either in the printed format for traditional study or in the electronic format for, for e-learning, uh, how to actually, uh, whether to use the soft or the hard version, uh, and uh, how to incorporate corpus examples uh, smoothly into the uh, flow of the lesson. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, you can hear the applause. Just a second. Um, here we can see the reference of the journal where Harek is an editor, uh, to your journal. Okay, and now we, I, I will just comment on the third speaker who is not here or with us today, uh, Gerhard uh, had a family problem, so he will not be able to be even in Skype. Um, and the thing he wanted to, to, to touch, the topic he was especially interested in, w would be the answer to your question, uh, where to put an emphasis, whether on just creating language resources or on applying these language resources, because he has been working in the field of 
creating European projects like Larin, for example, where different resources were collected, but mostly they were oriented to tra professional translators, not to those us teachers who who would like to teach uh, to to you to find some resources or to use resources for uh, teaching English. Um, I, I think now uh, would be a nice now moment for Alejandro to start speaking because uh, he in particular puts an emphasis on the students' participation and um, uh, making uh, students uh, hold up the well the the power. Well, I mean the teacher should be he says. Uh, the one who should guide them as, and students should be active. That's why he, now he puts an emphasis on data-driven learning. Am I right, Alejandro? Yeah, okay, yes. Uh, I'll be talking uh, maybe a bit less than, than Jarek uh, uh, because uh, I simply drew some notes, as, as you may see. Uh, can, can you see the, the, the notes? Uh, yeah, we will. I, I will open them now, just a second. Yeah. Some uh, some observations that I that I, that I summarized uh, on my on my experience uh, with uh, DDL in, in LSP uh, contexts. Uh, so uh, some notes uh, you can see there that I just sketched uh, a bit uh, too fast uh, the other day, and you can see um, some references at the bottom of the, of the of the page, uh, which are just very few of them that I, that I read uh, uh, in the past uh, two or three years and which uh, uh, confirmed or uh, added uh, some knowledge, some ideas that I already had. So I, I, I could connect some, some, some notions from past experiences to, to these new ones. But these are the notes. I mean, if you see number one, the, the first idea I... I Open them in adult reading now because they were in the first. Okay, uh, uh, then we will be able to see you speaking and your notes at the same time. Yeah, now we'll okay. it. Okay. All right, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so I, I thought that uh, I, we had to deal more before uh, with the issue of, of having our students appropriate the technology uh, to appropriate their digital interests. It's probably much of students working with kinds of computer devices nowadays and uh, the way of, of being able to, to deal with digital readings. It, uh, it doesn't mean they are successful at it, but at least they have the, 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 the access and the, the, the technology there. Um, so I think we are moving more towards the, the, the problem of having, of having to integrate DDL as one more instrument, as one, more, one, one method in the classroom, which, uh, which may comprise different ways of approaching the task. We could have students uh, search for information, find different things, identify <coughs> key language we are interested in, uh, concepts in their speciality, uh, translating uh, direct or re right, uh, in the, uh, reverse translation, uh, inducing uh, meaning, uh, uh, inducing functions uh, in, in language, Applying this uh, probably to, to some in some project, uh, maybe as part of a bigger project, or producing these uh, in a, in these uh, tasks, uh, written or oral tasks. So different uh, challenges that we could we, sh we have to cope with uh, in the con in the different contexts in LSP for for DDL. A second point I, I thought about was uh, from my experiences and some readings I have, uh, I have um, uh, read lately. Uh, I think the idea of, of correlating what kind of activity, what kind of tasks you want to, to, to deal with, with the students, and, uh, and their own uh, needs in the, in the LSP context, uh, and level also, language level, which is important at least in the, in the, in the context uh, where I teach, where there are levels that range from A2 to B2. I mean, you have different uh, mixtures uh, sometimes in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same class for the same uh, uh, ESP course. So uh, these things you have to keep in mind. Uh, not all students uh, can have the same uh, 
capacity, the same command, to be able to comprehend uh, uh, the, the task uh, linguistically and, and in terms of how, how to, what to do with this, with this information. So, uh, different things here, I, I just noted down, like, I remember like, some, some successful things we did, uh, at least in, on the part of the, of, of the different levels of students that I had. Uh, so we had uh, reversed, reverse translation worked quite well for intermediate business English, uh, I remember. And uh, uh, for other uh, more advanced students, we could do more inducing uh, of meaning and functions uh, in, 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 in the DDL activities. So uh, just, just to give you two examples there. So uh, the next point I noted down was the, the, the actual work with the corpora, and uh, as Ina and Jarek have already said, uh, the ad hoc corpora are quite important. I also worked with them. Uh, it doesn't mean I also worked with conventional, uh, bigger uh, commercial corpora uh, online and um, on CD-ROM back uh, in the old days. But now, uh, uh, well, in LSP, I, I, I decided at some point that I that the ones that I, I manufactured uh, uh, that were homemade, made, made by myself according to the, to the needs uh, I saw in the context, tended to work better uh, for, for the students. They, they saw these as more applicable and more convenient for their studies. Um, so I think uh, the, the first point to have in mind would be to, to as, as Jarek has already mentioned, has already mentioned uh, the, 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 the different text types and genres that they have to cope with. Uh, this is a, a very important thing to have in mind. And so you have to study that uh, beforehand, before you, 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 you think about what kind of corpus, what kind of ad hoc corpus you want to, to manage the time. And uh, uh, another point, as you can see there, uh, it would be to have a, a DDL as a, as a beneficial activity for them, not as a, as a burden or as, a, as an extra load for, for them in, in class. Huh? So it could help them to, to understand things and to, to be able to exploit written oral skills. And as Jarek also already <coughs> mentioned, uh, that uh, you could have them write in forums and uh, carry out different tasks and uh, even projects, uh, give presentations. So this DDL technique could be integrated in that process. Huh? as some type of tool that helps them uh, master different items in the, in, the, in the texts. And finally, as a point, well, two important points I also thought about was that you have to keep in mind what kind of language you want to, you want to exploit. Uh, so this comes from, I think this almost naturally comes from the experience that you, you have uh, by uh, uh, working with the, with the corpus. Uh, and uh, draw those frequency lists and coming to terms with the, uh, with the semi-technical collocations that uh, are abundant there and uh, keywords that they, they appear recurrently. Um, these are very important vocabulary. If you already have a very good corpus in their field I and mean, in their specialty, uh, this, this language is, is, is key for them. It's not just frequent in terms of absolute frequencies in the, in the area, but uh, it's, it's relative frequency. It's, it's a relative frequency that is important according to, the, to their needs and to the required competencies and uh, readings that they, they have to, to, to carry out. So, uh, uh, these, this exploitation is important, I think. Uh, it has to be very, uh, very consistent and, and intensive. It's not a matter of, of, of going to the computer lab and uh, the expect, expecting students to understand what you want them to do in, in, in two days or even two weeks. I mean, it takes a long time. It takes the whole course, according to my experience. You have to work with them all the time and uh, to, to guide them as a teacher to be there uh, and uh, facilitate the content to them, uh, explain why this is important and, uh, and motivate them in some way by, by, by work, as I said before, by working with different activities and, and uh, selecting those that, that really motivate them to, 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 uh, get, to assimilate the, the knowledge uh, the, that you want them to as, as a teacher. So that's more or less all I, I had to say as, as, uh, as my, my introduction to the, to the topic. Uh, there are so many things we could talk about more. So uh, I'm open to any types of comments, uh, discussions, questions, anything that would be great. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much.
Okay. Thank you, Alejandro. It was a pleasure. Um, now we are going to welcome uh, another guest. Uh, in fact, we wanted uh, Gennady Ivanovich Latkov to speak, but uh, who is going to speak will be Svetlana Lidiova from Gimo University as well. We'd like to welcome her. Well, the thing is that um, I would like to probably share some of the ideas with you, probably so that we could discuss things together. Um, the fact is that uh, our institute is unique in many ways, or our university is unique in many ways, because uh, we are, um, teach students who are going to be diplomats, uh, people working in marketing, in business, um, the people who um, are going to be international uh, journalists, in many ways. Practically, uh, people who will work in um, international affairs mostly. So, of course, for us, it's very interesting to see uh, that people, uh, students who work, uh, study here, are going to do have. Uh, so, you have classroom with computers, right? Do you do it in class itself, and how much uh, does it take for students to fill in all those things? Because I think it could be time consuming. Are you speaking to... No, I'm, to I'm asking... I'm, oh, uh, just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, both probably. Mm -hmm. okay. well, Go ahead, Alejandro. <laughs> right, yeah. From my experience, as I just mentioned a little bit, uh, I, I taught uh, different uh, types, of, types of students, ESP mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, at the beginning, in the first uh, years, I taught computer science students. And they were quite good at, yeah. at getting to know the tool, the, the tool itself. We, we were working with word, wordsmith uh, tools, and uh, it was version 2.0, a very primitive version, <laughs> but already had all the functions, I mean, the, the, the utilities for, for, for normal work with uh, corpora. And uh, they, they got it uh, very fast. I remember. I mean, I, I'm impressed now because I'm looking back in time, and, and I am impressed how fast the computer science students got to 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 know uh, what kind of functions the, the utilities did, what for. I mean, they understood all the 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 buttons right right away. Uh, they they weren't so good at uh, knowing the implications of that. I mean, knowing. Why we are, uh, why clusters are important? Why mm -hmm. these frequent clusters that appear here are important? So maybe they, they weren't so good at the li linguistic part. Like uh, if I said, well, could you the, you notice that uh, the, these form occurs almost all the time in the passive? So they didn't care. I mean, if it's the passive or the active, I mean, mm -hmm. they just you know they work quite well. But uh, in terms of grammatical questions and things like that, they, they couldn't get the linguistic part. They were more interested in terminology, maybe, and things like that. And then I had all kinds of uh, contexts. Uh, uh, in tourism, uh, these people, well, they had a good level of English. They, having a good level of English, I think, is very important. To, to be able to work yeah. with them, I mean, yes. and then of course, then there are more, more problems with working with the technology itself. With uh, they forget, I mean, the students who are not familiar with wordsmith or any concordance, they forget where the collocations button is, where whatever is. So I have to to be behind them all the time in, in terms of the technology with with these other students. And but if they have a, a better level of English. I noticed they understood the linguistic concepts, and they they they, they, they knew. I mean, they, what I was asking, uh, and then now I, I have these teachers. I mean, pre-service teachers, uh, people who want to, to be teachers, and they are working on their exams to be teachers. So they are taking these courses in the master, yeah. and I, I I've, I've taught them to use uh, different mm -hmm. corpora, and these corpora are, uh, could could be a bit complicated, like. You know uh, the the coca corpus on, online on, on the internet and things like that. And it's taken me the whole uh, semester to teach them. I mean, it takes a long time. Yeah. But uh, but I, I am I am quite uh, happy about most of, of, of the results. I mean, most of them liked it, understood why it is important for teaching, and uh, some some people uh, used it later for their own teaching units when they had to to design our own teaching units. 
So, you know, different results depending on different uh, types of students and uh, levels, levels of, of, of electorate is, is quite important too, I think. But as, as one last thing, as Jarek said before, and I, I, I fully agree, I mean, you could have uh, all kinds of concordances. Uh, uh, you could have printed material uh, with lower level students uh, to, 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 t to start from the very scratch uh, with them. Uh, you don't have to go in and jump into the technology if you don't want yes. to. Uh, so, yeah, different approaches, I think. Yaroslav, uh, what would you add to this? Yes, if I may, uh, I kind of adopt a slightly different approach to the one uh, that Alejandro presents. Most probably, uh, I do not work with information science students, but rather with humanities, different different areas of humanities, and, uh, and depend on one particular corpus. I want them to be able to find a corpus, uh, choose the one that is more appropriate for this or that goal, and perhaps uh, switch to another one if uh, the student sees that this is not really uh, what he or she expects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, because that's practically what we are doing. Because mm. uh, we mainly use it as a reference, probably, uh, at Good. this stage. So probably we then go on <laughs> and do something uh, more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, and but at this at this stage, uh, our students are very enthusiastic because of it, because they can see so many examples of, <laughs> and collocations and frequency, and uh, they like it very much. Because when they compare um, the material that they can find in corpora and concordances, of course, it's, it's an ocean of emotions. Because uh, comparing to usually uh, ordinary dictionaries, they can find quite some information there so that they could work with it and then develop it into essays, presentations, and the language that they use is at a different level, much higher. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> so probably um, we are looking forward to seeing you here in our institute sometime so that we could have some training courses. You may even, is it possible? That would, have? <laughs> that would be a great pleasure. Uh, be very nice. I live in Lublin and Lublin is not that far from Russia, much yes. closer than uh, Estremadura, right, Alejandro? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> we'll be very happy to see both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, probably we have more questions to answer. Uh, if you have a question, could you come up here and ask me, please? Anyway, um, the question I wanted to ask really is, um, I, I can see the point, obviously, um, pedagogical point of the ad hoc corpora, but I just wondered whether you'd found any use for the corpora which other people have developed. Um, for example, I suppose they're more academic English than, than uh, ESP, but there's the um, My Case Corpus at Michigan, Michigan Corpus of Academic Spoken English, but there's also a written English component of that as well. So it gives a range of disciplines at the uh, university level. And then you have, uh, in, in Britain, we have two corpora, I think, I haven't used either of them, but I've heard about them. One is called BAWE, Barway, British Academic Spoken English Corpus, and the other one is BAWE, BA, British Academic Written English. So, I mean, people have put a lot of effort into developing these more general purpose um, ESP or E. AP corpora, and I just wondered if you could say something about whether you found them useful in any way, or whether you think the ad hoc route is, is really the one which has the best uh, pedagogical payoff, as it were. May I? Uh, they can uh, search the corpus by different types of speech events and different uh, uh, interlocutors, which very nicely exposes the idea of, of tagging in a corpus. So, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, we explore, we expose them to different, different ready-made corpora. Just as I said uh, in my previous answer, we teach them or we show to them uh, which of these corpora are relevant for which areas, for which purposes 
this, uh, we show to them uh, the difference between uh, monitor corpora, uh, representative corpora, and, 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 and all those other types. Uh, we show which of them are closed and finite and which are still expanding. So absolutely yes, uh, I don't really think that we can go to ad hoc corpora, teacher-made corpora, before uh, teachers get really good understanding of what data-driven learning is about uh, based on all those uh, big, uh, well-established and renowned uh, resources. Yes. I, I agree with uh, Jarek. Uh, yes. Um, I never used uh, any of those corpora, the large corpora with uh, ESP students, uh, because I always wanted to have the, the readings, the texts that they, they had to use uh, in their own studies. So I, I was interested in homemade corpora uh, in, with uh, grad, undergraduate uh, ES, ESP uh, students. But uh, I, I've used uh, Bauer and uh, Bayes, the oral part also, and uh, my case and all these, um, with uh, uh, students in the master uh, I was talking about before. And uh, I, we used the, all these corpora uh, during four, four months in one semester. And uh, I got all kinds of uh, impressions from, from the students. Some people really liked them and they, they saw that it was very interesting to, to get to, 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 to draw comparisons between different types of uh, errors uh, made by nationality, different nationalities or different types of uh, styles uh, that they, we could uh, compare. Mm, but uh, of course there are, were also people who were very agnostic and very much against it and they didn't see the point of, of, of having uh, uh, corpora as reference uh, for, for their own teaching. So, I mean, uh, of course, this is, it's been my first year and uh, I would like to continue exploring this path in the, in the future. Um, so I, I could uh, contrast this information with more, more students and get all, all other responses uh, as well. But as I said, with, with ESP students, I, I, haven't, I haven't used them. I thought uh, mainly because I, I wasn't going, I wasn't addressing the needs, the specific needs they had in my class. Uh, I, I, I always felt more comfortable with addressing their own needs in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the Spanish uh, context that, where we are working. You're speaking about the relevance of this text to students, yeah, which is really yeah. important, I also, <laughs> on this opinion. Okay. We have another question. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for answering. Olga yes. Bariskina, uh, Baronish State University. Um, the question is: uh, You have mentioned some of you have mentioned uh, legislation database. What is this? Okay, it, it was myself. Uh, a perfect example of a legislation database is uh, the database called Eurlex, which is uh, a European uh, database of uh, all acts passed by the European Parliament and uh, the European Commission. And it's, it's a very nice example of a, of a database with parallel texts, that is, texts that are the same translated into all possible languages, uh, official languages of the, of the European Union. And uh, this is a very nice, uh, a very nice tool for uh, our uh, specialized area students to uh, to start compiling their corpora with, because it's it's searchable by topic. Uh, all uh, documents are in.